can we talk a little bit about his poem London, which is um, sort of quite accessible? Uh, and I think it's, you know, it, it's got a lot to say to us now. Um, we're hoping Before to you, sort of, yeah. yeah. What, I, what, what I wanted to show people was, this is a very good example of a poem where the illustration and the poem itself are in a kind of tension. Um, remember that Blake thought that living in contraries, as we do, um, it's not like you choose to live in a contrary world. If you open your eyes to the way the world is, it's full of contraries. Um, of war and hate, of belonging and not belonging, of, uh, you know, feeling satisfied and feeling dissatisfied. And I think one of his key messages is that's by plunging into those contraries that actually you find a way further and further into life. And so he this- says, He says ma man was made for joy and woe, I think. Yeah, but, uh, but this, that, so that's a very interesting little um, three-liner because it's man was made for joy and woe, but then he continues, and when this we rightly know through the world we safely go. So there's something about understanding the tension that can enable us to find a way through the world safely nonetheless. So he is, although he could um, paint and talk about the desperate side of life, um, he, this is his Christian side really, it's a side that's often forgotten now, but he knew that it's through the cross that resurrection is found. Um, and so he didn't want to turn his back on the suffering, but appreciated that through that can be found a dimension of life um yeah so look if you are you going to read the words tom to london because it's a, it's yeah. a very de depressing distressing it's portrait a very depressing of london. Poem, yeah but uh, at the same time this is the header let me show you it now so i hope you can see that with me ducked down uh, oh you can see that my bold paint um but uh i'll come up again uh, but uh <laughs> it's, it's it's a rather kindly image that's the point of a young mm. child helping an old man through these streets of london mm. and so hold that illustration in mind um if tom if you want to read the words okay i'll, I'll read the i think it was written in 1804 published around 1804 um and you know it's it's been picked up by various radicals as a you know, it's sort of anti-capitalist, uh, like as in Jerusalem, it's, you know, he talks about the, the um, dark satanic mills. Uh, and uh, in this one, as I said in my newsletter earlier, you know, this is sort of quite obvious ideas about, you know, child labour is attacked and the idea of chimney sweepers. Um, the fact that, you know, uh, grand palaces are, are, are bought with the death of soldiers uh, and, you know, the Industrial Revolution, as I said earlier in my newsletter, I mean, it's incredible that in, it, it took until the 1840s or 50s to bring in a 63-hour working day for children. <laughs> like, so you, you sort of wonder what on earth the working day was like for children before that act came in. Um, and the act was bitterly resisted by, you know, a lot of the mill owners. So there's a lot of that stuff that's kind of political. It's sort of fairly, uh, you know, sort of standard, I suppose, sort of... Um, socialist radical stuff uh but you know but there's so much more to him than that and i think mark's very keen for us not to kind of reduce him to um a sort of merely sort of polemical um you know sort of rabble rouser anyway uh julian might you might put this up in the in the uh text uh, uh what's it called the chat down the side i wander through each chartered street near where the chartered thames does flow and mark in every face I meet, marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every ban, the mind forged manacles I hear. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. But most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlot's curse blasts the newborn infant's tear and blights with plague the marriage hearse. So I suppose, Mark, in the first verse is, you know, Chartered Street, Chartered Thames, everything's planned, um, labelled. Uh, it's a kind of moneymaker's utilitarian fantasy. It's a grid, you know, it's sort of kind of lifeless. Yeah, and remember that um, he is at the beginnings of what we now call the Industrial Revolution. So he very much sees what's coming. This is part of his remarkable prescience. Um, 
but I think this is also why he's not just the kind of state of the nation, state of Georgia and England, um, proto-socialist kind of writer, because even in the early appearance of the dark satanic mills, um, you know, the, one of the most famous expressions of, of this, um, he is seeing through to the spiritual significance. What's the kind of underlying consciousness? What is being unleashed in this world? Um, and so he wants us to think more deeply, not just as a word, join in the melee, trying to put things materially right, but to see that what we desire and how we live in a material world is itself an expression of something else. Um, and so, and in fact, the, I, the, I saw another play this week um, on Saturday. Um, I went to see Jerusalem, um, which is the Jez Butterworth play that's been revived and is just uh, coming towards the end of its run, but you can still just about find the odd ticket here and there. The one starring Mark Rylance that's been massively celebrated. Um, and, you know, some people are saying it's the best play written in the 20th century and all that. Um, but when I was reading about it, um, I really um, thought that Jez Butterworth understood something um, that was very Blakean, which is he said he wanted to write not a play that could be said, this is the 1980s, this is the 1990s, or even now the 2020s, um, but that captured something that in his, in his case had been lost, that these different eras of our times now um, are just expressions of. And unless you try and feel into what's being lost, you're just going to be tinkering at the edges, um, you know, which isn't completely bad because if you do reduce the numbers of, of hours that a child has to work in a week, then clearly that is a benefit. Um, but um, push further, he's saying, um, Jez Butterworth was, and I think that that's a very, very Blakeian sentiment as well. Shall I carry on, Tom? Or do you want to? Yeah, because so I want to pick up on this, particularly this phrase, mind forge manacles. Well, that's what I want the... to have a look at. Yeah. So, yeah. We, what, what does that um, what does that mean? I mean, I wrote about it in um, uh, one of my books, How to Be Free. Um, and to me, the mind forge manacles were the, you know, uh, 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 the things that you you can't really blame on external si situations. I mean. Uh, you might be in a very unhelpful social situation, but still people sort of insist on forging their own manacles, um, almost sort of voluntarily, which they, they don't particularly need to. Um, or is it forged by, by someone else? But it, it's, it's something, it's some sort of a lack of freedom in the, in the human soul or spirit, uh, which Blake is, is seeing in people. And he's saying, well, they don't have to, they don't have to, um, be manacled in that way and fettered, you know. Um, they could they could remove these fetters and manacles if they if they wanted to. That's what I saw in it, um, and it's relation to the modern world where people say, "Well, oh, I'd like to um, do X, Y, or Z, but I can't because I've got this, I've got my job or my mortgage." And but these are things that people took on, you know, sort of voluntarily. So to me, it brought up those sorts of ideas. Um, there were, and perhaps that people sort of sometimes prefer uh, being manacled to being sort of free. Um, but that's not really what the rest of the poem's about. So I don't know what you, if you agree with um, those sort of rather random thoughts. Yeah, well, and I think that I think that there's a lot in what you're saying there, of course. Um, but what's I think part of Blake's mature philosophy, um, and which is even captured in this phrase, "mind for manacles," is that the darkness itself is a clue to how to rediscover the light. And what he's saying there is that this unfreedom that results in all these, this suffering, this woe, this sort of uh, blighted life, um, ultimately it is an expression of how minds have been trapped um, in the manacles um, you know, which is it's a, such a brilliant image because, of course, manacles are kind of made of iron and this is the Industrial Revolution. So you can really feel the spirit of the age that's clamping down on people like manacles. Um, but this is also to say that our if our minds can produce this imprisonment, then our minds also might 
be able to find ways of escape and indeed know an experience of life that's not manacled at all, but is actually free. And that's the sort of turning points. That's why the contrary is worth holding on to and not just sort of trying to get rid of one or the other, because by looking more and more deeply into what's been brought together, you can see how other possibilities arise. And to put that more tangibly, I think that's why in this poem, when he illustrates it, he has at the top this image of the old man being helped by the young child, because he's saying, in spite of the darkness, can you look at where people are living a different kind of mental vision of life? Um, they're inwardly much freer, like the young child, who is perhaps a chimney sweep in one moment, but it still has the kind of capacity, the innocence to help the old man in another. And so this is us using our inner freedom, which I think Blake thought could never be taken away, regardless of the external conditions in which we find ourselves, because we're always free to look differently and to try to allow ourselves to be drawn towards the light and not just feel trapped in the darkness. And so there's something really powerful in this idea that, okay, our manacles are mind forged, but if the manacles are mind forged, then what else can our minds reveal to us? And I think even in this poem with the illustration, he's saying there's light that our minds can seek out even in the midst of all this darkness.